Thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, I must say it's very much a pleasure to uh, be here and at the same time be with you. So uh, I hope it will be all clear, and uh, what I would like to do is to uh, give a presentation on persistent organic uh, pollutants, and then in particular in the marine environment, and trends in uh, known and uh, emerging uh, compounds. So I would like to start with um, some uh, ideas, some uh, thoughts about the environment itself and, uh, and the quality of our environment and starting with maybe a, a simple definition uh, on the environment uh, that is in fact what is around us, that is what the word means uh, and there are a number of very positive elements in this environment we see a biodiversity, we see many animals, we see many plants a lot of things we enjoy, there are all sorts of geographic aspects so it's normally a pleasure to be in the environment as a human being. But sometimes the environment can be harsh for us. There can be catastrophes, uh, natural disasters, and of course there is also pollution. And particularly on the pollution side, I will go a bit more in depth uh, today. Environmental pollution has always been uh, an issue, but particularly a local issue. In the, the old days, when people started to, to, to live and to, to, to do labor, living in small huts or in tents, already in those days there was pollution. But uh, there was pollution from using simple materials, there was our own personal pollution of course, but we could simply get rid of that to, to use the distance, throw it away, put it on a distance from the place where we were living. Uh, and there was space enough, so there was never so much a problem because there were small numbers of people and there were huge amounts of environment. So if we put it a bit on a distance from where we were, there was not uh, really a problem. But a few things have happened and particularly over the last 100, 150, 200 years maybe, we have seen a growth in the world population. Uh, Around the years when I was born, it was about 3 billion. Uh, it's climbed up until 6 billion. Very recently, there was the 7th billion person in the world. It was not celebrated anymore. I think that was a good idea, as the UN normally used to celebrate those, uh, uh, those, those uh, moments when there was another billion. And we look forward and we see that around 2050, we will have about 10 billion uh, people in this world. That's a lot of uh, people, a lot of persons. And if you look at, at in a different scale, it's actually much more worrying. Uh, we see that we have a sort of hockey stick curve. So particularly over the last uh, 100 years, there is an enormous growth. There is an exponential ex uh, uh, growth <coughs> in the population. Uh, and that, I think, is worrying. Uh, I discuss this sometimes with, with uh, colleagues here who do other things than chemical pollution and I think that universities uh, should spend more attention to this enormous growth and I know that it is related to uh, religion sometimes or to other, uh, uh, other factors which can be very difficult to influence but at least I think it is something to, to discuss. Now something else what has happened is what we call the industrial uh, revolution. So uh, suddenly there was a steam engine. So uh, we were suddenly able to produce more materials and more uh, in interesting devices and, and all sorts of things which could be very helpful in our life. Also chemicals were more easy to produce. It started with dyes later on with all sorts of useful chemicals. But it meant that in fact the pollution, which was very much local, went global. Uh, suddenly we were polluting the air, our water, uh, also inside our, our houses and so on. But particularly by air pollution, the pollution was traveling. Chemicals came into the air, from the air into the water and so on. So suddenly, it was not a local issue anymore, but we were talking or starting to talk about global uh, pollution. And if we look now uh, to the way we're living, we see that uh, uh, 
uh, we are using a lot of resources in our world. We not only pollute, but we are, are uh, really using resources. We do a lot of mining. We use all sorts of uh, very valuable uh, resources in the world for the way we live. And people have tried to express that on a, a certain basis. In fact, to try to, to calculate how many parts of the planet we are using. And the frightening thing is that if we all would like, uh, if we all would live as for instance in the United States at the moment, we were actually in need of more than five planets. In Europe, it is maybe already around three planets. Also Spain is here, but in the Netherlands, of course, it's the same. Uh, in China, you would say maybe this is about okay, but uh, China, of course, as we all know, is exponentially growing at the moment, so that number will change. And if you go to India, but particularly to Africa, you see that there is still a lot space, people are not using all the resources and are very modest in the way they live. But this also means that when we have only one world, we have to adjust. Yeah, we tend to be, be, become more clever and be more efficient maybe and try to reduce the, the, the pressure on the resources. But basically the message is that we have to change our style of living which means just live more simple, probably. So these are some worrying aspects and uh, some examples maybe to, to, of what, what we do and how we uh, uh, put pressure on the world is uh, traffic. There's more traffic, we like to travel and it's very pleasant to travel and we do that by car and we do that by air and uh, but all ways of traveling means that there are exhausts and exhaust means also chemical pollution. Polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are, for instance, an in interesting <coughs> example uh, of traffic exhaust. Of course, there is also more CO2 production by traffic. Uh, we use all sorts of chemicals to travel because the, the cars have to be safe, they are fire retardant, uh, they are painted, and so on. There's a lot of chemicals involved in that. When we use ships, there's also chemicals involved, because on the left side you see the ships, and it's, they are uh, very pristine when they're being built, and we like that because they are fast, and there is uh, particularly uh, good, uh, yeah, good speed when the ship is in the water. Uh, on the other hand, when on the right picture, if the ship is in the water, you see that there is uh, growth of uh, all sorts of small creepy animals and it uh, slows down the speed and uh, that uh, we coat the ship with uh, anti-fouling uh, so that can be siloxane for instance there has been a lot of organic tin and there are many other compounds ergarol is an example and all those com uh, compounds are basically contaminants because they are uh, released from the coating at a certain moment. So if you look into shipping lanes in the North Sea, for instance, you see that whelks, uh, and shellfish are uh, sometimes having or suffering effects from organotin compounds. And also we know already that sil siloxanes, which are also used, are sort of uh, covering these areas, the sea in the shipping lanes, and uh, making that uh, the, the biodiversity is getting less because not all these small animals, worms, and what have you, can grow furthermore. Uh, there's also the uh, personal care products. So, all together, we use a lot of personal care uh, products, and uh, through our waste. Uh, uh, sewage uh, systems, these personal care products are not completely broken down, but they reach the, uh, the marine environment. There's also uh, the issue of uh, all sorts of pests. So we have uh, insects, and this is an example of the malaria bug, of course, uh, which we have in our uh, uh, still present in, uh, in Africa uh, and we need to get rid of that and unfortunately we have not come so far, we are only using
So uh, this is polluting our, our world. Another example is the, uh, the use of uh, uh, food packaging materials. So we have uh, nice boxes for pizzas, for instance, uh, but these boxes are treated with perfect are uh, not broken down and at the end uh, enter our uh, environment and can also enter fishes and maybe enter our bodies. Also, of course, there is a direct exposure of these boxes and other papers which are sometimes used into the food. So there's another additional risk of that. These perfluorinated compounds are also um, used, for instance, in ski wax. It's not uh, something you would, uh, you would expect, but uh, they are in ski wax to polish and make sure that we can uh, enjoy skiing much better and things are going faster. Colleagues of us have, uh, uh, have uh, studied Swedish athletes, for instance, and these perfluorinated compounds came into their uh, bodies uh, from the, the wax procedures. Perfluorinated compounds are also uh, being used in uh, all sorts of other materials. They are in uh, fire extinguishers, there are all sorts of plastics materials, they are in scotch card, there are all sorts of materials in which uh, they are being uh, used. Uh, we use a lot of electronics. I'm using a computer now, we use a lot of television. Uh, all these uh, electronic devices are normally very much flame retardant. That has to be done by law. Uh, but these flame retardants can emerge from the uh, electronic devices into the dust. Uh, and uh, the dust, of course, can come out of the machines and go into our living rooms and so on and cause contamination again. So cats, but also small children, uh, crawling around can inhale the dust. And with that also the chemicals. Here you see some more information on the application of uh, flame retardants. So you see that a lot is used in building materials, but most of them are used in E&E, &E, electric and electronic devices. In textile there are also uh, flame retardants, in transport materials. Uh, we are very scared for fire, and that is realistic, because fire is a big problem, but because of that we use many flame retardants, and these flame retardants are causing problems sometimes for the environment. There are advantages of brominated flame retardants. There are all sorts of flame retardants, but brominated flame retardants is just one class of these flame retardants. Uh, there are advantages, because we can use more flammable materials by using DFRs, as they are called. They are efficient, less is needed than other flame retardants. They are widely available, uh, they are very cheap. But there are disadvantages, and the disadvantages are mainly for the environment. Some of these brominated flame retardants bioaccumulate, they come into organisms. Uh, some are very persistent. Uh, some are distributed worldwide uh, and some are very toxic for humans and for wildlife. Now sometimes, of course, we need materials. Uh, and this is an example which came very close to me. I was coming into Toronto airport at a certain moment for a conference. And just before I came in, there was uh, a plane crash. An Air France plane came in and crashed. And if you see this picture, you think there's maybe nobody who survived, but luckily all the people in the plane survived. And that happened because the plane was heavily flame retardant, uh, with brominated flame retardants. And the firemen, the fire brigade who came, used a lot of triple F to extinguish the fire. The triple F is uh, containing a lot of perfluorinated compounds. So locally, it was really... Uh, uh, an environmental disaster, but of course none of the people in the plane would have very much minded because they were so happy that all these compounds uh, we, were being used. So just to tell you that you can look for a different, from a different angle and we have to find the balance. We need materials in our modern world, these materials contain chemicals, but at the same time uh, these chemicals of course contaminate uh, our world. 
And to give an example, in the United States, per year, more than 3,000 victims uh, are, are found due to fire, which means 10 every day, which is a lot, of course. And we haven't got to really a complete clue what the victims are due to environmental disasters. Well, this is something we study, and we have an environment in which there are many, uh, many complex processes going on. Uh, we have plants, we have sediments, uh, and we have all sorts of different parts in the water, and chemicals are evaporating, and then, of course, are coming in. Uh, so these processes are very complex, and we are studying them. But one thing is very clear, uh, particularly for the marine environment, we can say it's in fact the waste bin of our world. Because through rivers, through uh, 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 air pollution, lots of chemicals uh, come into the marine environment. Uh, of course, we have sewage treatment uh, plants and we try to, uh, to protect uh, the marine environment from chemicals coming in through uh, waste streams but it appears that many of the persistent com compounds pass these um, uh, uh, waste uh, uh, treatment plants and arrive in the rivers and through the rivers into the marine water. Uh, of course, nowadays people talk about climate change, so uh, the, also the marine uh, water is getting warmer, which means basically that uh, the process of evaporation is faster, so there is more evaporation from the marine environment into the air. But then there is also more rain and intense rain, so the chemicals come back again in the rain and back into the water. So the climate change is mainly caused, causing that the whole process of evaporation and uh, condensation is more intense and more frequent, but it doesn't change so much the concentrations in the marine environment. Now, when we talk about persistent organic pollutants, most of them are remaining there, so they're persistent, but they're also uh, looking for a place they're feeling happy. That is often not the water. Uh, it's more the lipids in organisms, and it is the sediment, maybe. Uh, but if it goes into the lipids of, uh, of organisms, uh, we, of course, are also eating fish, and that means that by eating fish also we have a certain dose of contaminants. This is just an example of biomagnification, and we know that uh, for compounds like DDT or PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, they are so persistent that uh, all through the food chain, from small plankton to zooplankton to small fishes to larger fishes, finally to maybe seals and polar bears, there is an increase in uh, concentration of more than seven orders of magnitude, which means the concentrations in, at the end of the food chain, including ourselves as humans, are about 10, maybe sometimes even 100 million times higher than what is in the, in the uh, low end of the food chain, such as phytoplankton. Uh, that, as such, of course, is worrying. And then, of course, we have, uh, this is an example of uh, a whale I, I met near Boston. These compounds come in huge amounts into certain whales, and certainly also in high amounts in polar bear. And then we, of course, have to study the effects, and we are worried about, uh, about the effects. Something else, before I continue on persistent organic compounds, is marine litter, and particularly marine plastic, and maybe in particular also microplastics. Nowadays we are using so many plastic bags in the world, and we are doing so many other things with plastics, that uh, these plastics also arrive in the marine environment. Uh, and at the end, plastics are often fragmented but they end up as small particles, microparticles, sometimes even nanoparticles maybe, but uh, they arrive in the stomach of fishes. This is just an uh, example here of the stomach of uh, uh, a fish from the Pacific, which uh, contains many microplastics. Uh, microplastics also go into larval, for instance, herring, and as such, as, as such they have a physical effect. But they also have an, an secondary effect, 
because these microplastics often contain again our persistent persistent organic pollutants. PCBs are there. Hexabromal cyclododogen and flame retardant is uh, is there. Uh, we have uh, PCBs, DDTs, uh, PAH is even so, and also aliphatic hydrocarbons uh, present in these uh, microplastics. They come into the fishes, and in the stomach of the fishes, the uh, the pops, as I will abbreviate them, persistent organic pollutants, are sometimes released and go into the animals. So the animals get an extra dose of uh, pops when they're swimming around and they absor absorb these um, small plastic particles. So we are rather worried at the moment and we are happy to see that at the moment also in the European Union these uh, worries are shared and there are calls for proposals to pay attention to microplastics and also in the United Nations and in, in other uh, uh, marine organizations uh, these plastics and particularly microplastics are on uh, top of the list for, in, of points of attention. So hopefully uh, we, uh, we will see more studies and more measures taken against these microplastics because uh, it is uh, it's rather worrying and particularly also worrying because of these secondary effects. Now a bit more focus on the POPs. As you maybe know, they're in UNEP, the United Nations Environment Programme. There is the Stockholm Convention, and the Stockholm Convention is there to take measures against POPs, to make sure that these persistent organic pollutants are going out of our world. This is not easy because they are persistent, and most of them will stay with us for a long time. But at least we can uh, uh, make sure that they are not being produced anymore. Well, some of them, like the chlorinated dioxins and furans, they are produced uh, uh, unintentionally. So they are not produced on purpose, but they are produced because other of these pops are present in waste, for instance. So in waste burning and waste incineration, there is a production of chlorinated dioxins from PCBs and maybe also from hexachlorobenzene. So we have to reduce these other pops. PCBs are banned worldwide. They are not allowed to produce anymore. They are still around us in many materials, in many applications, but many authorities try to get rid of that and dispose them properly so they are being burned at high temperature, so they are not entering the environment anymore. Uh, DDT, as I mentioned, is there because there is still uh, a struggle against malaria and unfortunately in Africa we still have to use DDT. In other countries this is replaced by pyrethroids. Pyrethroids are not on the list uh, of UNEP for the Stockholm Convention of POPs, but we know also pyrethroids are actually coming into dolphins and other fishes nowadays, so there is a risk also for alternatives. Hexachlorobenzene is uh, certainly banned at the moment. All these drinks, as they call bilderin, endrin, aldrin, are not allowed to be used anymore. Toxaphene is very much re reduced in use, and we have European laws on how much toxaphene can be present in, in fish at the moment. Cordains, Myrex, is, Myrex is particularly used in, in the United States, but not anymore. And recently, only two years ago, uh, we have seen a new uh, addition to the, the list of POPs in UNEP. So we have the brominated flame retardants, at least some of them, the pentamix, pentabrominated diphenyl ethers. Uh, we have uh, the deca brominated uh, diphenyl ether, which is not allowed to be used anymore on electronics. Uh, we have seen an addition of PFOS. So one of the main perfluorinated compounds. Uh, we have seen an addition of hexachlorocyclohexane, such as lindane, for instance. Endosulfan has been added, and also QCB, pentachlorobenzene, has been added uh, to this list of pops. This means that for all those compounds we can see bands, and they are not uh, allowed to be used anymore. But unfortunately they are still there. So, for instance, in the Netherlands we have been studying eels because we saw that eels, we had a strong impression that eels were suffering from, uh, from PCBs. 
And here you see um, the eel, of course, but you see also a trend of a monitoring program, which we started about in uh, 1978. And for more than 30 years, we have been measuring the PCB concentrations in eel. And we see that it is going down. And obvious, even for the persistent compounds, uh, these uh, trends and levels uh, are going down in organisms, but it's just because they are so persistent that it will take a long time. And before, for instance, the PCBs will be under the limits of detection in eel in the Netherlands, it will take more than uh, almost 200 years. Only in the year 2200, we will probably not be able to see PCBs anymore. All the time, we will have them in our fish and get them into our bodies. Uh, the eel stocks have decreased very seriously. So, uh, it started in the 1980s. <coughs> we see that they are now under the biological acceptable minimum. Uh, the class eel recruitment is very, very small. Of course, we know there is also class eel uh, uh, catchment still going on in some places. Uh, but we think that the class eel recruitment is also very much suffering of the, of, the, of the contamination. So basically, the European eel is now an endangered species, and part of that is probably related to PCBs, because the eel is in that sense a very vulnerable animal, because the lipid content is very high. And here you see a graph of some locations in the Netherlands where we have monitored the fat contents in eel, and we have seen that the fat content has gone down. The explanation may be more complex than we think, because female eels, for instance, have lower fat contents than male eels, and uh, this is uh, uh, maybe also a shift from male eels to female eels, which can explain lower fat contents. But also that may be given in by the PCBs, because PCBs has also have uh, uh, also an effect on the hormones, and maybe the sex hormones have changed, and we know that when glass eels arrive into the Netherlands, into our country, that uh, the sex has not been determined yet. So maybe we see more female eels now than male eels, and because of those changes, also again the stock is, uh, is suffering, and we see a lower fat content in, in, uh, when we take cold samples. Something more on the flame retardants, you see uh, some examples here of those on which we are most worried, which are these, uh, the pentamix. This is an example of brominated diphenyl ether number 47, the tetra BDE. The uh, totally brominated BDE 209, the deca brominated diphenyl ether. We have tetra bisphenol A, which is a bit more polar, but may also have some more stronger effects. And we see here the hexabromocyclododocrine. All these compounds are biocumulative and come into organisms and also into humans. And it means if we study, for instance, peregrine falcons here in Europe, this is from the United Kingdom, we see levels to quite substantial levels uh, in uh, these predatory birds, up to 24 microchemical kilograms. This is a, an overview of levels. Uh, you see a log scale of uh, PBDEs, polybrominated diphenyl ethers, in different matrices um, in wildlife and in humans. We see Swedish breast milk uh, here on the lower end, but we also see uh, herring gullex at the, at the top end here. Uh, we see harbored seals from the uh, United States, San Francisco Bay, uh, US breast milk also here. Canadian breast milk. Uh, so we see there is quite a range, but particularly on the top end, in this herring girl, girl eggs from uh, Sweden, we see the levels in these eggs are over 1000 uh, nanogram per gram on a liquid weight basis, sometimes even up to 10,000 uh, nanogram per gram, which is 10 microgram per gram or 10 milligram per kilogram, which is, of course, uh, very high. So we see our marine environment worldwide has been seriously polluted by uh, dominated offender eaters. Now luckily we see a ban in uh, Europe, we see a ban in the US. It's unclear what the situation in China is, and in China there is a lot of production also of PBDEs, so it's still unclear what is happening there. 
And also when it is produced in China, it will also be seen back in our European fishes, for instance. Uh, we have a European project going on at the moment called Enviro with an F. The F, of course, is related to fire. Uh, and in that project, it's very interesting because it's, it's very new and renewing in a way. We work together with universities, authorities, but also with uh, companies producing uh, flame retardants, uh, try and see uh, if we can find alternatives feasible alternatives, because scientists, of course, can easily dream up other flame retardants, which maybe can, be, uh, can do their work and protect us against uh, fire. But maybe companies would say it is really not feasible to produce that. So we do it together with, uh, with industry, on the flag of the uh, European Union, and uh, we try to find alternatives for the brominated flame retardants, because most of those are probably not safe and sooner or later will bioaccumulate or will be toxic. But we try to find alternatives which are safe, of course, in a situation where there is fire, to delay the fire, to protect humans against fire, but also to, uh, uh, to make sure that they are safe for the environment and to make sure that companies can produce them in a, in a reasonable way. So at the moment we're looking into inorganic flame retardants, metal-based flame retardants, which uh, seem to be good options, compounds like zinc, stenate, for instance. We're looking into phosphorus-based flame retardants, some of them may be good options, although phosphorus can also lead to toxic effects, so we're not completely sure about that at the moment. Uh, we're also looking into nanoparticle-based flame retardants, for instance, to be applied in paints, on cars, or in in other applications. So hopefully this will offer a perspective uh, to offer the world more safe flame retardants in the, in the near future. Another group of compounds per fluorinated opioid substances is particularly known because uh, these compounds are also accumulating, but they accumulate in a very different way. They're not so much only in the lipid layers of organisms or in humans, but they're also more into the blood, for instance, because they're bound to proteins. They have polar groups, for instance, PFOS, as the perfluorinated uh, octyl uh, sulfonate. We have the perfluorinated uh, octyl uh, uh, acid, with uh, an acid group here. There's also the PFOSA, with a different group again. All these fluorinated compounds, but particularly the PFOS, can be found in the environment, but the distribution over the water phase and the uh, lipid layers are, is completely different from what we see for PCBs and brominated flame retardants. Uh, these uh, compounds have been produced already since the 50s. Initially, uh, it was uh, produced by electrochemical fluorination, which delivered us more straight-chain isomers. Later on, it was the so-called telomerization process in which uh, we had, had even more straight-chain uh, isomers, so up to 98% of the compounds uh, which were produced were uh, straight chains. These compounds, I mentioned that already, are used as uh, are applied as surfactants. All sorts of consumer products they're used in in industry, metal plating, semiconductors and so on, in aviation, uh, fluoro plastic production, the, the, uh, the well-known uh, frying pans uh, in which PPIP is being used, in firefighting foams in this triple F, and in food contact materials. And uh, here again you see clearly that they have two ends, a non-polar tail and a polar head, which makes them uh, effective uh, very much, uh, they are very good as a fat and dirt repeller, but in the environment they distribute over the water phase and the, uh, the liquid phase. If you ask for concentrations, then you see that these are typical concentration ranges. They are found into, in, in water, in, even in drinking water, they are found, found in sea and uh, surface waters, but they are also coming to our food and they're also found in, in fish in levels up to about micrograms per gram uh, in different types of uh, fishes. 
This is something completely different. Uh, we have uh, chlorinated paraffins, and they have been produced for a long time, but actually people, even up to uh, uh, higher levels in the, in the United Nations, thought that most of the problems with chlorinated paraffins in Europe and in the USA were more or less solved, uh, and levels were sort of stabilizing. Uh, but now we found out, only two years ago, that uh, particularly the short-chain chlorinated paraffins, which are uh, carbon chains of about C10 to C13, are uh, produced in uh, exponentially rising numbers in China. Uh, and these are uh, chlorinated hydrocarbons. They are definitely persistent, uh, they are definitely by accumulating, and uh, the numbers we see of the production in China are really worrying. Basically, this, uh, this graph, which was shown by Professor Kubel Young in the, the opening lecture of Dioxin 2010 and the conference in Beijing in China, uh, these numbers show that at the moment, about every year, in total, the production of chlorinated paraffins in China alone is just uh, about the same uh, to the total PCB world production ever. And this is really a very, very high number. And I'm not saying here that the effects of chlorinated paraffins are exactly the same as those of PCBs, because here we're talking about aliphatic compounds and not of aromatic compounds, so the behavior may be different, and the effects may be different, but the fact that so much, in these days, so much of a chlorinated uh, hydrocarbon is still being produ produced in the world, is very serious, and it will make that we will see these compounds in the coming years in our fishes, also in the North Sea and the Atlantic Ocean and up to the North and the South Pole. So I think that uh, much more attention should be paid to this, and I know that at the moment also in the UN people are talking about coordinated uh, paraffins. Maybe they should be placed uh, on the on the Stockholm Convention uh, list. But as Professor Young said, if these are going to be put on the on the unit list, then Chinese industries will very much suffer. Because these compounds are very much used, and for instance, in metal industry, if you are drilling a hole, uh, then you have to use chlorinated paraffins, because otherwise the edges are not very smooth and so on, you have to be cover. So, uh, what well, we will watch this process closely, but this is one of the, I think, future emerging compounds in the green environment. Oh, I'm very sorry. Uh, some further <coughs> development. The uh, REACH uh, is a, a system we have in Europe nowadays, a program for registration, evaluation and authorization and restriction of chemicals. Uh, at the moment there is a registration of about 1500 chemicals of high concern, the so-called uh, high volume production chemicals, which are produced at levels more than 1000 tons per year. They need to be registered and it's being done. Um, and hopefully you each can help us also uh, to break the loop of uh, what we see in fact each time producing other chemicals. <laughs> which at the end are dangerous for us. Uh, we have had the PCBs, which were also used as flame retardants. Then we got uh, other flame retardants. Now we have brominated flame retardants. Maybe we go into phosphorus flame retardants. And all the time, we see that there are still negative effects. So what we need is a system that will test also the alternatives before they come into the market, so that we have chemicals which are safe and do a lot of good things for us in daily life, but are not by accumulating in the system. We also have the Water Framework Directive in Europe, which is a mandatory monitoring program for European uh, countries and will monitor closely these compounds in the marine environment. Now, we are, of course, also looking into the effects, and I have two slides at the end very briefly talking about effects. We just started another European project um, with uh, many <coughs> other European countries. It's a nine, bill, nine, sorry, nine million um, uh, budget, so we can do a lot of studies here. 
and we particularly look into neurotoxic effects of all sorts of additional and emerging chemicals. You see the list, it's also including organophosphates, it's a number of pesticides, including pyrethroids, uh, but also the classic, classical organic organochlorides, uh, even metals and perfuminated compounds are also there. Uh, there are all sorts of suggestions, at least, that young children are learning slower, they are suffering from ADHD, they are very uh, overactive, uh, <coughs> all sorts of other neurotoxic effects, but it is not completely clear if that is related to these chemicals. So we want to study that, and hopefully we will also be able to study the, uh, the combination of excess of FX, uh, um, posed by all these chemicals to young children. That is one, and another project we have going on at the moment uh, internationally is called Obelix. It is uh, particularly studying the relationship between prenatal exposure to the chemicals I have mentioned and obesity. So is obesity not only caused by simply eating the wrong things, going too much to McDonald's maybe, or eating hamburgers, or is it also maybe initiated by a much earlier process that we are exposed to these chemicals and uh, even maybe when as a, fe uh, a fetus we are still in the, in the mother and that gives a sort of blueprint for later on sensitivity for obesity. It may well be the case, there are all sorts of suggestions for that in the literature and we're studying that by all sorts of test systems. We work, for instance, a lot with zebra fishes because the genomic characterization of zebra fish is very close to our human, human genome. And we're trying to see the effects of these compounds uh, in those fishes and try to translate the effects uh, to humans. Coming to some conclusions. Clearly, we see that the trends of classical pops in European waters are declining. Uh, but they are persistent, so it will uh, still cause uh, a long, uh, a long high time. A long time, these chemicals will be around, but the trends are going down. Uh, for the brominated flame retardants, uh, we see some bends, and the levels are pretty high still. But hopefully, the bends will also lead to uh, uh, decreasing trends. Then, of course, we have to study really the alternatives and make sure that the alternatives are not as bad or even worse than the brominated family products, a process which is going on. We worry about chlorinated paraffins. We expect that levels will rise also in fish in the coming years due to the extreme use in China at the moment. We know very little on combined effects. I think as toxicologists, I would really like to, to see that we study more the combined effects, and it is difficult and it is complex. We shouldn't go out of the way of complex things. We should spend more uh, attention to combined effects of chemicals because it's largely unknown. And then, of course, we also see the microplastics, a sort of new phenomenon. It's something we could maybe expect for a long time because we are ex uh, using so much plastic. But there is a new concern, uh, these microplastics, and particularly the physical effects, but also the absorption of persistent organic uh, pollutants to the microplastics. With that, I would like to conclude my, uh, my lecture, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, I must say it's very much a pleasure to uh, be here and at the same time be with you. So uh, I hope it will be all clear and uh, what I would like to do is to uh, give a presentation on persistent organic uh, pollutants and then in particular in the marine environment and trends in uh, known and uh, emerging uh, compounds. So I would like to start with um, some uh, ideas, some uh, thoughts about the environment itself and, uh, and the quality of our environment and starting with maybe a, a simple definition uh, on the environment. Uh, that is in fact what is around us, that is what the word means. Uh, and there are a number of very positive elements in this environment. We see a biodiversity, we see many animals, we see many plants. 
a lot of things we enjoy, there are all sorts of geographic aspects, so it's normally a pleasure to be in the environment as a human being. But sometimes the environment can be harsh for us, there can be catastrophes and uh, pollution. And if we look now uh, to the way we are living, we see that uh, uh, we are using a lot of resources in our world. We not only pollute, but we are, are uh, really using resources, we do a lot of mining, we use all sorts of uh, very valuable uh, resources in the world for the way we live. And people have tried to express that on a, a certain basis, in fact, to try to, to calculate how many parts of the planet we are using. And the frightening thing is that if we all would like, uh, if we all would live, as for instance in the United States at the moment, we were actually in need of more than five planets. In Europe, it is maybe already around three planets. Also Spain is here, but in the Netherlands, of course, it's the same. Uh, in China, you would say maybe this is about okay, but uh, China, of course, as we all know, is exponentially growing at the moment, so that number will change. And if you go to India, but particularly to Africa, you see that there is still a lot. Yes, when I was born, it was about 3 billion. Uh, it's climbed up until 6 billion. Very recently, there was the 7th billion person in the world. It was not celebrated anymore. I think that was a good idea, as the UN normally used to celebrate those, uh, uh, those, those uh, moments when there was another billion. And we look forward and we see that around 2050 we will have about 10 billion uh, people in this world. That's a lot of uh, people, a lot of persons. And if you look at, at in a different scale, it's actually much more worrying. Uh, we see that we have a sort of hockey stick curve. So particularly over the last uh, 100 years, there is an enormous growth, there is an exponential ex uh, uh, growth <coughs> in the population. Uh, and that, I think, is worrying. Uh, I discuss this sometimes with, with uh, colleagues here who do other things than chemical pollution, and I think that universities uh, should spend more attention to this enormous growth. And I know that it is related to uh, religion sometimes or to other uh, uh, other factors which can be very difficult to influence but at least I think it is something to to discuss now something else what has happened is what we call the industrial uh, revolution so uh, suddenly there was a steam engine so uh, we were suddenly able to produce more materials and more uh, in interesting devices and, and all sorts of things which could be very helpful in our life. Also chemicals were more easy to produce. It started with dyes, later on with all sorts of useful chemicals. But it meant that in fact the pollution, which was very much local, went global. Uh, suddenly we were polluting the air, our water, uh, also inside our, our houses and so on. But particularly by air pollution, the pollution was traveling. Chemicals came into the air, from the air into the water and so on. So suddenly it was not a local issue anymore, but we were talking or starting to talk about global and natural disasters. And of course there is also pollution. And particularly on the pollution side, I will go a bit more in depth uh, today. Environmental pollution has always been a, an issue, but particularly a local issue. In the, the old days when people started to, to, to live and to, to, to do labor, living in small huts or in tents, already in those days there was pollution. But uh, there was pollution from using simple materials, there was our own personal pollution of course, but we could simply get rid of that to, to use the distance, throw it away put it on a distance from the place where we were living uh, and there was space enough so there was never so much a problem because there were small numbers of people and there were huge amounts of environment so if we put it a bit on a distance from where we were there was not uh, really a problem but a few things have happened and particularly over the last 
100, 150, 200 years maybe, we have seen a growth in the world population. Uh, around the 